हेलो गाइस हाउ आर यू आई एम हरदीप सिंह वेलकम बैक टू योर ओन यूट्यूब चैनल आल्स अपडेट्स एंड रीसेंट एग्जाम्स फॉर मोर अपडेट्स रिलेटेड टू रीसेंट आल्स एग्जाम राइटिंग दस टॉपिक्स लिस्टिंग रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस टेस्ट एंड स्पीकिंग क्यू कट गेस्ट वर्क प्लीज गाइस पार्टिसिपेट इन एवरी डे लिस्टिंग एंड रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस टेस्ट टू अचीव योर डिजायर बैंड स्कोर इन योर एक्चुअल आल्स एग्जाम Please hit the like and subscribe button. Press the bell icon for the upcoming notifications. Don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page Alts updates and recent exams. Part 1. You'll hear a woman talking on the radio about sport aid. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello, you're listening to Redgate Radio and I'm Alex Dunbar. As you may know, people in the city will be taking part in Sport Aid this weekend. Here's Liz to tell us more about this event and how you can get involved. Thanks Alex. Well, this is the 4th year of Sport Aid and it looks like it's going to be bigger and better than ever. Sport Aid is organized by the city council and it supports a number of different charities. Although the main reason for its existence is to raise money to help developing countries. Last year, it raised over 100,000 pounds and that money has helped to make life a little easier for people in many parts of the world. Just to give you one example, the village of Otunga in Chad now has a water supply, meaning that the people no longer have to walk miles every day just to get water. And there are countless stories like that. By contributing to the infrastructure of different regions, it's hoped that things like sport aid will enable many more people to climb out of poverty. Another way in which that happens is by giving people the knowledge and skills to earn money. One of the biggest issues facing people in many poorer areas of the world is education. Something that we take so much for granted can be rare and expensive in some regions. Education is seen as key to development and money from sport aid has paid for school rooms and equipment in a number of places. So what can you do to help? There are lots of ways in which you can get involved. First of all, you can go down to the biggest attraction of the day, the Sport Aid charity football match. There will be thousands of people at City Stadium and all the money raised from the sale of tickets goes to charity. There's much more going on than just a football match, of course. There will also be lots of entertainment for the whole family, including a fair, stalls selling all kinds of food, and even a chance to try out some sports you may not have tried before, like softball and volleyball. It's probably going to be a very active day, so it's best to make sure that everyone is in comfortable clothes before you go down there. It's always a fantastic day out, and it's a great way to show your support. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. But you're not restricted to being a spectator. Apart from the main event, there are a large number of smaller events taking place across the city. These range from fun runs around the park to games of cricket, and there's sure to be something happening in your area. Contact details are available for the people putting together each event, and you can get those from the council website. We'll be giving you the address for that at the end of the program. It's still not too late to organize your own event as lots of people around the city are. Although, you'll have to get going on it now. First of all, do check that there isn't a similar event in your area and then call the town hall to register your event. 
the local council needs to approve all events and you'll stand more chance if you can come up with a sport that's new to some people rather than just another game of football. Use your imagination or try the internet to get some ideas. Try to come up with something that's going to get lots of people along and which will raise money. You might not want to go for anything that turns out to be too costly though since the council isn't able to supply bats or balls or anything else you need but they will give you advice on finding a good location and might even be able to help you out with small prizes for winners, as well as making sure that everyone knows about your event by publicising it on the website and sending you an organisers pack with lots more information. There are a couple more things you need to be aware of for your event. There aren't any age restrictions. Although, if you're under 18, you'll need to get an adult, such as a parent, to sign the forms for you and to handle any money raised. But you do need to live in the Red Gate area. You should also be prepared for anyone to turn up, since all events are public. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You will hear a local radio program about cycling courses in London. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. There's been a great deal of interest lately in encouraging people to use bicycles instead of cars as a means of transport. But not everyone is confident about riding a bike at the best of times, let alone in the middle of a city like London. Jack Hayes is a professional trainer who works for a London-based company, City Cyclist, which provides cycle training for the public. What exactly does City Cyclists do, Jack? Well, our basic purpose is to promote cycling as a sustainable form of transport. We believe the best way to promote cycling is to teach people to use their bikes safely and with confidence. In European countries, people all learn from their parents, and they also learned in school. And when I tell them I teach people to ride bikes, they laugh. They think it's crazy. But here in London, it's completely different. You're approaching the point where a whole generation of people have grown up not being allowed by their parents to cycle because it was considered to be getting too dangerous. And so, in turn, they can't teach their children. We believe in realistic training. So if someone wants to use a bike regularly, say to get to work or school, we aim to train them by teaching them to ride on the actual roads they'll use so they can develop the basic skills they need and build up their confidence that way. At City Cyclist, we believe cycling's for everyone, no matter what age or level of ability or mobility. We do complete beginners and also advanced courses. That's for urban cyclists who want to deal with things like riding in streets with complicated intersections and things like that. We don't promote the use of personal protective equipment for cyclists, and we endorse the policy of the European Cyclists Federation that parents should be allowed to make an informed choice as to whether or not their child wears a helmet. We believe the key to safe cycling is assertiveness, taking your place on the road. This has to be instilled right from the beginning. Assertive road positioning and behaviour is the key to safe cycling in congested urban environments. Some people are surprised that we don't promote the segregation of cyclists from motorised traffic, but we don't think that's practical in all urban environments. Instead, we teach people to use as much road space as they need 
to travel safely and effectively. You now have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. Now, as well as courses for individuals, City Cyclist provides a number of services for organisations. For example, we can deliver fun, safe cycle training activities at schools, arranging courses so that the disruption of curriculum time is kept to a minimum. As well as this, in order to promote safe cycling, we have provided training courses for employees and staff of local councils. And we are also increasingly looking at developing training courses in companies in order to help employers work towards green transport plans by helping to increase the number of staff cycling to work. Right, so that's a brief summary of what we do. If any listeners would like to find out more about the organisation, you can have a look at our website. That's City Cyclist. C I T I Cyclist. Co. Uk. And in order to book lessons, you can either phone us on 020-7562-4028 or do it online. There's an application form on our website and you can just download that and send it in. We charge £27.50 per hour for one-to-one -one lessons plus £6 for each extra person. So you're looking at just £39.50 for a family of three, say. If you've never been on a bike in your life before, we reckon we can get you riding in one hour, and for most people, a course of road training usually takes three hours. But whether you're a parent or a child, an individual or an institution, we'll be happy to discuss your special needs and make a program just for you. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You are going to hear a discussion between two students and their tutor about their research project. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Hello, Professor Hickey. Can we come in? Yes, certainly. Hello, Charlotte. Hello, Jim. Do come on in and take a seat. So, how's your research coming along? Mine's progressing well, I think. All my questionnaires are completed and I'm analysing the results. Excellent, Charlotte. Now, let me check. Your focus was related to the effects of sounds on productivity, wasn't it? No, that's Jim. Hmm. Mine is centred around multinational companies like Amazon. Oh, yes, that's right. So, how many questionnaires have you managed to get completed? Around 50, from about three different companies. Excellent. And what about you, Jim? Mine's not going so well, I'm afraid. I'm having some serious difficulties finding people who are willing to be interviewed. And so far, I've only found one person. People simply aren't getting back to me. Mm, well, that is one of the main difficulties when it comes to undertaking qualitative research, especially face-to-face -face interviews. It might be an idea to review the methodology you're using. Think of other ways you can obtain the data you want. I'd personally suggest organising focus groups, as people tend to feel less intimidated when they're not the sole focus of attention. 
You'll also gain a wider spectrum of results and save time. Mm, OK. To be honest, I haven't got far. I've still got two sections to complete, so I don't think it will hurt to move away from interviews. It's a shame, though, as my one interview gave me some really valuable insights. The employee talked about how much more productive they were when listening to music. And also, they mentioned how being more flexible in many aspects of their work really made them work better. I found that too. Flexible working was one of the most commonly cited reasons for productive working. Yeah, but interestingly, I read an article about working environments recently and it talked about big companies having lots of different areas for employees. You know, like sleep pods and cafe areas and terraces, that kind of thing. Well, the article said that although employees seem to like it, it's not at all cost effective. Yes, that's the Bonner article. It's worth reading if you haven't already, Charlotte. I will, thank you. Look, Charlotte, we'll come to you in a minute, but Jim, I think we need to think about your situation. You absolutely must get your research carried out in the next few weeks or it's possible that you'll struggle to meet the deadline. You know, if that happens, you automatically fail and we don't want that. Oh, I know, I think you're right. Maybe I'll start working on organising some focus groups in order to gather some data as soon as possible. Before you hear the rest of the recording, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. And Charlotte, you say you're analysing the results from your questionnaires now. Are you finding any patterns? Actually, I wasn't sure I'd find anything, but I identified some really clear patterns. I wasn't really expecting that, but I'm pretty pleased. And what have you found? Well, that more up-to-date working environments in all forms, so flexible working, forward-thinking workspaces, things like gems and gardens, all of them contribute to making a more effective working environment and ultimately making a more successful company. Mm, really? C can you say that? It's not what my research found. Remember that Bonner article? From my reading, I've found that only some of these practices are actually effective. I know I haven't conducted any primary research yet, but I don't think it's such a simple picture. I think there's a lot of discussion about these workplaces being great, but generally it's for recruitment purposes. It's not actually beneficial when working. You mean that these new style work practices and environments are a negative thing? No, not so much negative as irrelevant to existing employees. They're just there to attract new people, the best people, because the idea of working in a place with gardens and pool tables seems attractive. Jim, if you're going to make such strong assertions, you had better support them with readings and research because remember, your work is only going to have academic value if it's based on evidence. Charlotte, from what I can see here, your research so far is solid. I think you've got good questions on your questionnaire and you've collected some rich data. Remember to analyse the data very carefully when formulating your main points, though. Jim, I want to see you next week as you're going to need to begin this research with some urgency, so come back with what you've done next Wednesday afternoon. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. You are going to hear a part of a lecture about the economic cost of bad management. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Good morning. My name is Dr. Mervyn Forrest, and I specialize in management techniques and training. I've been invited here today to talk to you about the cost to the economy of bad management. And what I would like to dwell on first is an area that has recently been exercising everyone, and that is coercion in the workplace, or to put it more simply, bullying. It has been estimated that bullying at work costs the British economy up to four billion pounds a year in lost working time and in legal fees. And with the problem apparently on the increase, it is time that managers took on board what is happening. I would like to think that what is perceived as bullying is nothing more than lack of experience, insecurity, or lack of awareness on the part of managers, and not a conscious effort to attack someone. But that is perhaps a case of, um, of my being naive or overhopeful. Before we break up into groups to look at the first task on the handout you've got, I'd like to give you a start with some of the main bullying methods that have been identified so far. Basically, what I'm going to do here is to give you examples of one or two points. Uh, can you all read the OHP clearly? Yes? Right, off we go. The first item on the list is giving people tasks which managers themselves cannot do and which are therefore impossible to achieve. This is, in fact, a very common strategy used by managers to manage their subordinates. It gives certain people a false sense of security as they watch others failing while they try to achieve the goals set. Another simple bullying technique is constantly moving the goalposts especially when one's employees are in the middle of a task. This is not bad management, it is just plain stupid. All targets and goals set should be easily achieved within a realistic timescale. Sending memos to someone else criticizing the performance of a task where the individual has no way of replying is another common technique especially when the manager concerned does not reply or makes it impossible for subordinates to contact him or her by not answering the telephone or not replying to emails. This is not the style of a sound manager, but rather the antics of someone with emotional problems. If you behave like that, don't expect your staff to respect you. And now, the technological bully. It is interesting how all tools designed to help can be turned into dangerous weapons. The urgent email bully is fast becoming a problem in the office. Employees turn on their computers to be faced with a string of badly worded emails, making instant and often unrealistic demands, which reveal the hysteria mode of management. Have you ever felt a sense of dread before looking at your email, even your personal messages? All companies should develop a company strategy whereby there is an email code of practice, with offensive messages being forwarded to a designated person for appropriate action. I would now like you to break up into groups and brainstorm other bullying techniques which you think you may have experienced, and perhaps, if you're honest, which you have been party to. I can think of at least nine more bullying strategies. I would also like you to consider ways in which you think that each of the techniques on your list can be countered. Is everyone clear as to what the task is? Yes? Okay. You've got 20 minutes to do this. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. So guys, don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page. I'll update some recent exams for more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing as topics, listening, reading, practice test and speaking you cut guesswork. Please guys participate in everyday new IELTS listening and reading practice tests to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. For more IELTS material visit my official website www.ielsupdatesandrecentexams.com The link is given below in the description. If you need PDF files of latest IELTS material, then please join my telegram channel. So guys, please write your score below the comment section. Again, thanks for listening. God bless you all guys. Stay tuned. Stay safe.